in my opinion, it's usually better to invest somewhere else, which again is like contrary to popular belief. And there's lots of reasons why. First of all, I don't want to walk by my rentals anymore. <laughs> like, like I don't want to walk. Can like, you please oh, man, hang on a second? Can you or, can you please repeat like, that again? <laughs> Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I am the guy, Billy Keels. I'm your host, and I am really looking forward to welcome you to today's amazing conversation. You know what? Because it's just absolutely going to be awesome. Trust me. So, so here's the thing. Also, too, I just cannot thank you enough because you continue to come back twice a week listening to the podcast, sharing the podcast, and taking the lessons that you're learning and putting them into practice. You are also continuing to leave your honest written reviews and ratings. And if you have not, and you're sick of hearing me ask about this, go ahead and make sure that you do it again as well. Or go ahead and leave your honest written review as well as a rating, especially if you're on the Apple podcast platform. would really appreciate that. If you need some help, we have a very, very short video that you can listen to or watch as well. And just leave your honest written review as well as rating. For those of you who want to know more about how you can listen to the very early podcast. Just go to billykeels.com. When you're there, go to the podcast tab. You can find every single conversation in the video form, the audio form, and you can listen to it as many times as you want. Get that one you know, thing that you really wanted to learn and just practice it over and over. Go to billykeels.com. Uh, once you're there, go to the podcast tab, which would be phenomenal. And for those of you that are interested in knowing more about the accredited investor clubs, we've got some really, really awesome things there, especially for those of you who are wanting to find out more about well, how you can get some really specific tax benefits. Um, there's some pretty cool opportunities. So you may want to get in touch with us. AI club at billykeels.com would be awesome. So, and I will connect with you and we can have a nice little chat. So with that stated, listen, today's conversation is amazing. For those of you that are like engineering types, your mind is wired that way and you like the, uh, the hard data, the, all that kind of stuff, and you're really good with your numbers. Well, you know what? You can be great with that. And there's also the side of the business, which is understanding the soft skills. And you know what? You can go beyond your backyard. Yes, you know that. That's why you're here. And today's guest is really going to give you some amazing insight as to not only how he was able to do that, he was able to build business and is also Uh, really adding lots of value to people long distance. So today's conversation with Eric Nelson is going to be fantastic. And we're going to get to that just after this. Are you looking for a way to get to long distance investing success, but not spending all the effort? You want to do it in a way that's much faster and it doesn't cause as much pain? Well, listen, I can save you all of that stress. Just go to billykills.com forward slash seven mistakes and you can pick up your free PDF to help you on your road to long distance investing success. So you know what? If you've ever wanted to know how to create long-lasting wealth through long-distance investing, then guess what? Today's a conversation you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. I'm super excited about today's conversation. You know why? Because today's guest not only has a degree in civil engineering, he's also the owner and operator of a civil engineering company that focuses on residential work. He's definitely going to have to tell us a little bit more about that. He's also taking his skills to the next level and he's taking it to the multifamily world and he excels not only in asset management, in capital raising, but also in investor relations. And I'm sure he's being the father of two, he's probably also learned a couple of other things beyond that. And you know, he's the founder of Wild Oak Capital, as well as the host of the super popular podcast, Real Estate Mindset. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Eric Nelson. Eric, welcome to the show, man. Billy, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It's my pleasure, my honor. I'm so happy to be here. Oh man, this is going to be such a great conversation. <laughs> Just from like the first second we started talking, I'm like, wow, man, this is going to be awesome. Eric's going to bring so much value to the Going Long family. I know it's going to be awesome. Um, and as we talked about, you probably know, I'm going to ask you five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning. You're going to get three in the end. And then actually Eric in between, you're going to get more questions. I just have no idea what those questions are going to be. The only thing that <laughs> I can, should be, man. <laughs> right. The thing I can tell you, though, whatever the, the answers are, they're going to add a lot of value to the Going Long family. So if you're okay with it, let's jump right in and help yeah. the Going Long family understand where is it that you uh, live in the U.S.? Yeah. So I live in uh, Durango, Colorado. So Colorado is like middle United States, you know, center of like Rocky Mountains. So people think of Colorado as like mountains, right? I live in the Southwest and it's it's really the heart of it. The The pro is... 
you know, I'm right in the middle of all the mountains and all that stuff. We're actually kind of near the desert too. So it's this cool zone. Uh, the con is it's hard to get places, right? So if you're going to fly somewhere, you have at least two flights, you know, at least. So, uh, it's a great place to live. Like, I, like you said, I have two young boys. So I love raising a family in kind of a smaller town. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's unique because it's, uh, kind of tucked away. Man, that is absolutely fantastic. My few people know this, but I'm going to share it with you now. My brother and sister were both born in Colorado. So uh, we're familiar with it, but more towards Denver. And yeah, Durango is a very, very uh, beautiful place. So appreciate you sharing that. And the other thing, Eric, is um, the Going Long family knows this about me, but I would love for you to share with us as the second question, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Oh man. First of all, so much. Like I I love the positivity. I love the question. Like I I tend to be a little overly positive. Uh, my wife, I wouldn't call her pessimistic, but she's like more realistic. (laughs) And so she kind of like brings that level down a bit, but let's see yesterday I went skiing with my son, my oldest son who's four. And in the afternoon, uh, I got home and I went for this long bike ride and I was like, you can ski and ride in the same day. This is a pretty sweet place to live. And so um, and then I got home and it's just like one of those things, like you get home and you're kind of like refreshed after this ride and like spent just an evening with the family. Cause yesterday was Sunday mm-hmm. and just like the whole day was pretty much start to finish. Awesome. So I wouldn't say I have really necessarily one thing other than just like pure gratitude. In fact, I like, uh, I recorded a video so I wouldn't forget like while I was skiing, awesome. I was like, just be grateful for this stuff, man. Like don't forget what these blessings. So that's kind of a long answer to that question that there's a lot of positivity that happened to me within the last 24 hours. And it's okay that you over delivered right from right out of the gate. Like you're allowed to say more than one thing, <laughs> which, is, which is absolutely fantastic. And I appreciate mm-hmm. you sharing that because many times it is like the, the, the things that we do on a day-to-day basis that make the biggest impact. And many times we, what I found is that people, you may not stop to really appreciate just the fact that you've got the endorphins flowing and you've just spent time with the family and you've been able to, you know, not just ski, you've been able to go out bike ride and things like that. I mean, they're simple pleasures in life that make the biggest positive impact. So thanks for sharing that uh, with us. Really appreciate that. And then the other thing, Eric, I give myself this super impossible task. (laughs) It's really impossible. So you've had this very abundant life. You've done so many different things. And I try to distill it down to like three and a half seconds in your intro. <laughs> so almost impossible. So no, absolutely impossible. So the thing is, can you help bail me out? Because I would appreciate it if you could share your own backstory in your own words with the Going Long family. Uh, and then one of the things I will ask you though, is if you can also highlight some of the major decisions that you've made to get to this point in your journey, and then we'll see where you and I take the conversation from there. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I think success is like, um, you know, something that you kind of create, like there's absolutely some luck along the way, you know? So that's an interesting question to be like, what are some decisions along the way? So I, you know, I, like we were kind of talking off show, like I'm not really a traditional engineer, truthfully, like even in school, it was tough for me. Cause a lot of the people there, first of all, are way smarter than me. And second of all, just like, you know, typically a little bit less personable. So I had this sort of battle, like, yes, I excel at math. And so I chose that path just because it was like a lot of people like, oh, you're good at math. You should be an engineer, like that kind of thing. So uh, like school was hard for me in in that, uh, like, again, I wasn't the smartest person in the room by, by a long stretch. So I had to basically work a little harder than most of my classmates and then um, kind of push through that. And so what, what I realized was when I, when I got into the professional world, it was kind of this cool thing where I was all of a sudden knew how to be an engineer, could solve really good problems. Um, but I could also talk with people. Right. So, um, so what I did was I, I worked for a couple of people and I pretty quickly realized like, you know what, communication is a huge piece to any, any business, right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to start my own. Luckily my old boss is amazing dude. Uh, it's kind of a long story. My wife and I took a year off. We traveled South America because drove a car from Colorado to Patagonia. So that that's a whole wow. other story. Wow, so. unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de fuego. So like, okay, this is awesome. Yeah, man, it was it was a, a you know trip of a lifetime, right? So, yeah. but during that time, you know, my wife and I basically were like, I can go back to work for someone or I can just jump in. And the thing is, we were broke. Like we were traveling. So we were used to being broke. So I was like, yeah, yeah let's start it, right? If I don't make that much money, we can live off next to nothing. Totally fine. Mm. So that was a huge leap of faith, I guess you'd say, to start an engineering company. And so I partnered with a friend of mine um, and it's been successful ever since. That was in 2016, we started it. And then, you know, as as time rolled on, I basically kind of lucked into real estate investing. That's what I always say. So we had this single family house. The first house I ever bought was in college. 
and we kind of house hacked it. My brother and I like uh, decided, well, why would we pay rent if we could if we could buy a house and like rent it to our friends? And so we kind of did that again. It was like sort of accidental. It was like, oh yeah, we can do that. And of course, 2006, 2007 ish range, we got a loan, which we probably shouldn't have gotten, right? And that's like part of the <laughs> part of the problem. Luckily, we were you know responsible and paid our bills and all that stuff. We fixed up the house, sold it. But then you know, fast forward years later, my wife and I bought the single family. And I kind of like saw some houses pop up on the market near our house. It was like, you know, you could you could cover the mortgage with a renter in there. And that was basically the thought process. It was like, oh, cool. Then of course, someone inevitably turned me on to like bigger pockets. And I finally I kind of learned there's like math to this business, you know, it's like it's actually a business, not just like buying a house. So I kind of rolled into that and and then from there I got super lucky. Um to find a couple rentals that were pretty exciting. And, and I can go into that story if you want, because I think it's a pretty cool one. Um, sure, sure. My son and I, my son and I would go for walks. He was a baby at the time. And we would just go for walks. Like I'd push him in the stroller, cruise around the neighborhood. This is the four year old you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this All is right. yeah, roughly four years ago, right? So yeah. uh we'd just push him around and any for rent sign I would see, because at by this time I like kind of had my head wrapped around okay, what, what does this business look like? What does the math look like? All that stuff. So we, I would just push them around. Any for rent sign I would see, I would call and just say, hey, like, what are you renting for? And there's two reasons. Like, One, I wanted to know the rental market. Like, I wanted to know, rather than just like look at Craigslist, like, what are people actively listing for sort of? Mm-hmm. And then I would also say, well, you know what? I'm actually not really interested in, in renting. Would you sell your property? And of course, most people are like, oh, no, thanks. But I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, what's the worst case, you know? <laughs> so then uh, one time we were like walking up on this on this property. I could tell it was like a multi-unit, right? But I'd, I'd never really seen it in that light before. So I, this guy's like literally putting a front sign in the yard. It's super old sign, obviously recycled. Like he like tucked it away, mm-hmm. brought it out. And I looked and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was like, hey, how's it going? Like started a conversation, super nice guy. Uh, I was like, Hey, you know, what are you renting it for? Blah, blah, like kind of the standard questions. He's like, okay. And I could just tell he was like almost tired of it, you know, like, like just didn't want to be a landlord anymore. So I started to ask him like, okay, cool. And I was also thinking like, man, that rent is so low. It makes sense. Cause he like recycled the sign, you know, like didn't even bump rents for years probably. Um, so like, okay, well I'm not really interested to, uh, to rent, but would you sell it? It was like the first time he'd ever thought of it. He's like, um, yeah, you know, I might, um, let me, let me think on it. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me, let me give you my number. Um, no pressure whatsoever. Give me a call if, and when you're ready. So a couple of days later, he calls me. He's like, yeah, I thought about your, your offer. Like I, I would sell it, but I would need like a million dollars. And like what he said to him was this like enormous amount of money, which it is right. A million dollars mm-hmm. is a huge amount of money, but for a six plex in my market, it's actually a really good deal. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I could probably do that. <laughs> Let's uh, have you thought about it? So, you know, in the meantime, I'd researched the property a little bit, like gone to the assessor and, and I realized he didn't inherited it. He had no uh, mortgage on the property. Free and clear. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I said, Hey, would you consider financing it? And here, and I, I was like, and you know, there's some benefits for you too. He's like, well, you know, what does that, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? I was like, okay, well, that's cool. Let's like dive into this a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. So I kind of like educated a little bit on that. And I said, you know, think about it. Talk to your wife, call me back. Like same story. I gave him a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Calls me back. He's like, yeah, I've thought about it. I think we'd love to do that. I was like, okay, cool. But here's the thing. We have to have some certain terms to make it work for us. Like it sounds like this works for you, but can you like work with me? So we ended up putting $35,000 down on a million dollar property. And the reason that like I was able to kind of convince him that is three and a half percent down is kind of unheard of, right? First of all, it was a heck of a deal. So I was okay with that risk. And mm-hmm. second of all, I was like, you know, if worst case scenario, if I don't pay the bills, you just get your property back, right? And chances are, I've probably put some money into it. So you're going to get a better product than you had. And that's kind of your worst case scenario as a lender. Mm-hmm. So he was like, okay, cool, let's go for it. So we ended up getting this property as a sixplex, super low rents. And it took me some time because I didn't want to like just kick people out, right? So whenever mm-hmm. rents came due, we would fix it up and then bump the rents. And so that was kind of a, like how we got started in this world. And then from there, um, I met like my, my coach and mentor now at a meetup mm-hmm. and oddly he lived in the same town as me and he was doing syndication, which I didn't know what that was. Right. And, like a lot of people have never heard that word. Mm-hmm. So he was like, Hey man, have you thought about like partnering or like thinking bigger? Like you can, 
you can do this other stuff and it doesn't have to be all your own money. Because that was the challenge at that time was like, we're out of money. Like we mm-hmm. can't grow anymore. And I was just thinking like, the only way to grow more is to save up more. And he was like, no, actually you can partner with other people and grow. And so that's kind of where that, that growth uh, to syndication came from was like opening my mind like, oh, like I can actually have the knowledge and the hustle and like put people together and partner with people and, and do bigger things. So that's brought me to like some couple syndicated deals and uh, growing from there. So there's a lot of growth in that story. And what I love about what you've said, and I don't, I mean, cause it's just also to that. I mean, we have a lot of people that are highly talented salespeople. A lot of people that are, have been in like high complex sales organizations. And so one of the questions that I had for you as you were talking about this is, have you ever, because as a civil engineer, I'm, I'm, I don't want to ever assume anything. This is part of my, um, my, my relationship building and sales training is, so I have to ask the question, had you ever gone through any type of uh, sales training or anything like that before you started walking around the neighborhoods and with pushing your son? <laughs> no. What's so funny is I had it all. I still haven't actually to this day. Yeah. Um, and I have a, a close friend who's like in a, in sort of a mastermind with me mm. and he's like the master salesman. Right. So he like mm. gets hired to go in and, and help people with sales. And the, the more I told him about the story, the more he's like, dude, you should have locked that guy down. <laughs> like, I can't believe you gave him like four or five days for like just string him along. No. So, so here's what, and this is, so this is the beautiful part, right? And, and this is what I want people to understand from like going along family, you, you, hopefully. And if you didn't listen to it, I want you to go back and listen to what Eric just said, because as he's telling the story, this, this is about focusing on, well, of course, Eric was in, you were interested in getting more and more involved in real estate, but you saw someone who they weren't really even aware that they were probably open to selling, but I'm going to assume, and you're going to confirm for me, but when you ultimately had, when, when you ultimately came to an agreement was the person just looking for more money or was there something else that they were really trying to achieve when they decided to sell their asset? Yeah. I love the question. So I will say too, like, you know, I, I disagree with my friend who's a, who's the salesperson. Like for me, it was about the relationship yeah. and about exactly what you said in your question is like the perfect salesperson finds what they need. That's it. And That's then it. you solve their problem basically. That's it. So even though I'm not like a sales guy, I can at least say, you know what? Like it's relationship based one and two, like I can solve his issue. So That's what it. he wanted was what he, and this is like what came with the conversation. What he wanted was that monthly cash flow, but he was tired of dealing with renters. He was tired of painting. He was like, cause he was kind of doing it all. Like he didn't know any different per se. Great guy. I still talk to that guy. We still have like a relationship, right? Yeah. So um, to answer your question, yeah, he was like, because I, I kind of coached that into him was like, you can still get this monthly cash flow. Mm-hmm. You don't do anything, right? I'll pay you every month, ongoing, basically perpetually, because he's like in his 60s. And, you know, until I refinance, and I was like, dude, I'll give you a heads up. So let me actually take this story to the next level. Mm-hmm. I ended up selling that property to a person I met at a meetup. And, uh, it was kind of this random thing, like sort of same story. Like I was ready to sell to have some capital for syndication. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we'd put some work into it and fix it up. Right. And so it was worth quite a bit more. So I met this person looking to buy stuff and I was like, Oh yeah, I have this property. I might sell it. Like hadn't thought too much about it. But then I was like, you know what? Like this thought came to my mind is like, I don't want to do wrong by that guy who helped me out by financing. So let me call him and see if he'll continue that for you, which is what ended up happening. So he like, he is continuing to be the bank, more or less, still getting that cash flow. The seller was jazzed, or the buyer was jazzed because he's like, sweet, I don't have to go to a bank, right? Getting financing for a six bucks can be annoying. Mm-hmm. And I was jazzed because, like, sweet, like, you guys take it from here. You know, like, I made a little money and built this relationship. And so it went on. And so I think, like, the key to this whole story is like, because I was thoughtful of the other person as well, like, it kind of actually ended up in a good positive thing for all of us. Yeah. And so it's so just taking it to the next level. It just goes to show like, and, and so when I said earlier that you're, we have lots and lots of, uh, of people who have been in the sales profession, which I personally think is the most, uh, 
is the best profession that has ever existed when you do it properly, right? Because at the end of the day, when you are in the sales profession, you are listening to understand if what you can offer the good or the service in terms of what we do now, if you can, if that service will help to solve the problem of the person that is in front of you. If you're doing anything other than that, then it's, it, it, it is not, right? And it's many times perceived as something that is terrible and, and, and manipulative and all this kind of stuff. But at its essence, when you are working to give a solution to someone else's problem, typically it is, it is not just because they're trying to make the last dollar or the last euro or the last whatever currency you want to call it. And, and, and it's no surprise to me that you've been able to, you know, help to move that specific asset more than once. And you continue to make sure that the person who wanted their issue resolved is continue to have that over a longer period of time. So appreciate you diving into that because in, in going along family, I really hope that you like, if, if you want to listen to it again, like just rewind it and listen to it again or watch it again. I mean, it's, Eric's got a great smile when he's telling the story as well in the video version. So, <laughs> so check that out. Wow. Don't you just love this conversation? This is amazing. This is fantastic. And so just really quickly, I just wanted to remind you for those of you that are looking to create more options for yourself, get there faster and do that with long distance investing. Make sure that you go to billykeels.com forward slash seven mistakes to avoid so that you can avoid all those mistakes, get to your goals faster and sooner. Once again, that's billykeels.com forward slash seven mistakes to avoid. Now back to the conversation. So, so listen, so then that is actually your, so you're solving that challenge there locally. I think you started to go into it, but one of the things like with the going long podcast, like this is what we're here to about. And if you're not watching the video version, uh, you should check out the video version because Eric has this one word in yellow over his left shoulder, which is absolutely amazing. And it goes to kind of the basis of this question, which is when everybody tells you that you should do what you just did and you kind of buy the property and close by and you can walk around with your kid and all that other kind of cool stuff. You decided to also pivot <laughs> because I happen to know <laughs> that not only are you investing in Colorado, but you've also invested in other states like Colorado, like Oklahoma, like Texas. And that's like the whole thing about the podcast here. It's the going long podcast. Like, but the thing is it goes, it's very contrarian. So help us understand why in the world did you decide to at any point, whether it was actively or passively, to invest in something that was not literally a place where you could drive, walk around with your son in the cart and invest in your own backyard. Why ever would you go long distance to invest? Yeah, first of all, I like love this part of, of your message because I hope people are really listening. Like in my opinion, it's, it's usually better to invest somewhere else, which again is like contrary to popular belief. And there's lots of reasons why. First of all, or maybe just like practically, I don't want to walk by my rentals anymore. <laughs> like, like I don't want to walk by my Can like, you please oh, man, hang on a second? Can you or, can you please repeat like, that again? <laughs> exactly. It's super true. Like, I really don't want to like be, I don't want to see it, honestly. Like that sounds kind of like mean, but it's true. Like, because it's you take so much pride in it that if like, you know, they broke something or whatever, like it's honestly easier to have a manager like be less emotional about it. And they're probably going to do a generally a little bit better job on the business yeah. side too. Like yeah. I tended to be a little bit more like uh, caring, I guess, mm. than, than other landlords. I would like give lots of breaks and stuff like that. I think that's totally fine. I think that's good. Mm. Um, but if it, it is truly like a business, right? And so, yes. So the first thing I did was I, I decided to buy a house in Dallas, to like test the concept. So we bought a single family uh, got a manager. I just wanted to like test it because I was like mm -hmm. a lot of people really resistant to it. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that's been one of the best rentals I've ever bought. Like the manager why, why is good. That? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you were getting ready to say. Go ahead. Yeah, it's like, okay, first of all, like the market's done really well. So there is some luck involved, right? So we bought this house uh, like three years ago for 165. It just appraised for 294 last week. Like <laughs> just insane growth. Yeah. And you know, we've had, we've had like pretty good tenants. The manager's good. And again, it's not my backyard. So I don't ever think about it. Like mm -hmm. I really never, ever think about it. I just see the check come in. I'm like, oh, wow. I'm really grateful for that property. Mm -hmm. And I can text the manager directly. She's super awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's been like kind of proved the concept to me. It was like, okay, you can totally do this from afar. Mm -hmm. And then our syndications. Yeah. Like our market, my market's super expensive. It's, it's relatable to like California. Mm -hmm. So the price per door versus the rent you got to find a gym. You know, I was, I was able to find one of those in that sixplex, but 
it's super rare and it's just a hard market, right? There's a place for investing everywhere. So I don't want to say you can't, yep. but what we're trying to do is really challenging. So like Oklahoma, you know, the price per door, let's just say is $50,000 and the rents are somewhere between seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a month, right? So mm-hmm. start doing a little math and you're like, okay, yeah, that starts to make some sense. So we as a group, Wild Oak Capital came together and we purchased uh, some properties in Oklahoma. We closed on one recently in San Antonio, Texas. We have another one in a contract in Tulsa. So we're kind of like looking in those markets. And so to answer your question, it's absolutely possible. You know, there's a handful of tricks, of course, and I've, mm-hmm. I've alluded to it. Find a good manager, super key. Find a good broker or agent, you know, whatever you want to call them, super key, but it's definitely doable. So, so we've got a lot of people that are listening like, wow, okay, you've got this degree, um, you've traveled. Um, so you've got like this open-mindedness to do things differently. Um, and it all sounds really cool. But the next question, most people would say, yeah, you're saying what you should do, but can you maybe give us one tip on how you would go about, for instance, you said, you know, make sure that you have a really good manager. How did you go about checking to see that that manager met you, I guess, that they were a good fit for you and the goals that you'd set out for yourself? Yeah, super good question. So there's a couple of good books on that, right? So I think, uh, let's see, it's got to be here, right here, this Joe Fairless book, best ever. He taught, he has a bunch of questions in there and it is, it is like kind of around syndication, mm-hmm. but you can take it for any part. So let's say you're buying a single family, right? There's a list of questions to ask your manager. And even though it's a little cheesy to sort of like follow a script, you can take it like pick and choose, but Mm -hmm. it's laid out for you. Like it's literally laid out. Like here's some questions you should ask. And then, yeah, do they align with you? Like do their, do their priorities align with you? For me, it's like, I would rather take care of a tenant than worry about the bottom line. That's just like my personality. Like I'm not, and I was really honest about that. I was like, look, I want this property to shine. I want it to be like a really nice place to live. I want to fix stuff immediately. Like generally speaking, I don't care what it costs. If there's something broken, make it right. You know, it might cost me some money, but that's how it goes. So like, Mm -hmm. you have to think what's your priority and then read, you know, there's a bunch of books out there with questions and then kind of go from there. So that'd be kind of my advice is like, come with some questions and property manager are used to that. They're not going to be like, oh my gosh, why are you grilling me? You know? They're like, yeah, thanks for asking the questions. Like you're, you're a reason, like a responsible owner. That's exactly what I was just going to ask you. So, cause sometimes I think people get afraid to ask because they feel like they're going to be overbearing and all this other kind of stuff. But in general, I've found that when you come with really great questions, there is more of a tendency for the person on the other end to say, wow, okay, this person really knows what they're doing or they they know the questions to ask. Just curious kind of what your experience has been when you were going from a theoretical and then you take the theory and put it into practice when you're looking to see if there's a fit with the, with the new property manager. Well, I think, you know, I will say like, you're going to have to test the waters. There are times when those questions, they answer them all right, whatever. And then you start going and then all of a sudden you realize, okay, that's not the right manager. And I've done that. I've had to change managers. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. But you know what? Usually it's, it's a professional world. We say, you know what? It's just not a right fit find someone else. So you can do all the right things. At the end of the day, it comes down to implementation, right? So like if they're doing what they said they would do, like if, you know, if the property is performing, like, like they said they would do, like the other thing about property managers, I think they tend to be very honest because Mm -hmm. if they underperform, then you can just like, Hey, you said you were going to do this, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you, if they don't, you'd like, either we need to make a change or we need to, to change that thing that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would say it's like, you can ask all the right questions at the end of the day, you just have to kind of manage your manager. And I think that that's something that's like, you know, we call asset management, right? Like yep. make sure that they're sort of following up on their word, which again, it can be uncomfortable, but it's a business. Right. And again, like if you're, if you're sort of keeping them accountable, a good manager is like, yeah, sweet. I'm happy to report that this is what's going on and blah, blah, blah. Like, sort of, again, thinking that you're more of, of a businessman more than like a or businesswoman more than like a mom and pop owner, right? Just going yep. along with the flow. That's it. I mean, it is, it is about um, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so that is just another, another testament to that. So, so here's the thing, um, Eric, we're going to have to pretty soon get into the going long final three, but I do want you to talk to us a little bit about because some people are probably like, Billy, you talked about this yellow thing over his left shoulder and stuff like that. And um, I'm just curious. So talk to us a little bit about, because you are a fellow podcaster and I know you have uh, your podcast. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that and how you are also uh, going out to uh, to help those that are interested in this thing we call real estate. 
Yeah. So I think, uh, okay, first of all, it's called the real estate mindset. So thanks for the plug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think like when you first get into the business, right, you go to like some conferences or you read some books and stuff and you're, you're all about the nuts and bolts. And like, I've talked to a lot of people who like, when you press them, will admit this, you get there and they start talking about mindset and like vision and stuff like that. And you kind of roll your eyes like, Ugh, like this guru guy is going to make me like write down my vision and like goals or whatever. I want to know how to do a syndication. Like I want, like you kind of want the nuts and bolts, <laughs> but it turns out that the people who are successful, when you grill them about what's more important, nuts and bolts of the mindset, they'll say, well, they're both important, of course, but the mindset is key because it gives you longevity. If you start with the vision, the end in mind, and if you have like the right mindset to be like, why am I doing this? you will inevitably have way more success. And so it's not just mm -hmm. about success, of course. I mean, I love that you that you mentioned the word mindset and you like, I mean, it's bold on purpose, right? It's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the podcast is basically focused on, yeah, we talk real estate, we talk multifamily syndications, but then the whole second part of the show is always about mindset. It's like, what are you doing day to day that makes you successful? We even talk about what success is, you know, vision, that type of stuff, because it, you know, coming back to how we started this, that stuff at those seminars is super valuable. So like mm -hmm. the other thing for your going long listeners is like focus on both, like the pod, like the fluff as you, as it feels like when you first start, it's really, really important. A lot of the really good uh, programs or events or whatever will include some piece of that and, and pay attention to both. Yeah. And being, being able to pay attention to both is something that's absolutely critical and I would venture to say that, and you've said it uh, as well earlier, maybe in a different way, but the hard skills, those you can learn pretty easily. It's the soft skills. Those are where we need to put more focus and time and energy to develop because that's a lot of times where the connections come from. Um, and, and so being able to do both, it's not, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. It's how do I do both? Um, and being able to get it in the in the right um, in the right balance. So I appreciate you talking to us a little bit more uh, about your podcast. Once again, everybody, check out uh, the Real Estate Mindset. The thing is, Eric, we got to get to the going long final three, man. But the thing is, I never ask any of our <laughs> guests, and you're our famous guest today. Um, I never ask the going long final three unless you tell me that you're ready. So are you oh. ready? Well, unfortunately, I'm not. I wish we could continue. <laughs> like, I'd like to, I'd like to keep going, man. Like, like I could have three hours of this, right? But yeah, I know we do have a timeline, so I'll say I'm ready enough. <laughs> All right, you're ready enough. I love it. I absolutely love it. <laughs> so people were probably running on the treadmill. And they're like, "What? Wait on a second. He's not ready, or is he kidding? Don't worry. Get back to running. He was just joking. So here we go. So the the first of the going along final three is when I ask you where you were, and you told us where you were in Colorado. I'd like to bring things back to this side of the pond now. Um, and I would love for you to share with us, what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or still on your bucket list to visit? Um, man, I've been blessed. I've been blessed to travel and spend some time in Europe. So I lived in Lausanne, Switzerland for mm -hmm. like six months and that city's amazing. So if you haven't been there, Switzerland's itself, incredible. It's like, you know, it's on Lake Geneva. It's, it's just yeah. such a cool, cool city. It's like on a hill, you know, it has all that stuff. So that one's great. I will say, and I, I'm kind of cheating. I think Barcelona maybe takes the cake. Like, I think I told you offline, my wife and I took our son there and yep. he was young. Uh, and I hadn't been there in like 10 years. And it was the same cool, I mean, growing a little bit in Chainsville, of course, but the same cool, fun, beachy town that it was. Yep. And it's, it's just a great city. So I would put that pretty high. Okay, you put that pretty high, but I, I think it sounds like you're still going to go with Lausanne. Or Lo Lo Lausanne. All right, I'll go with Lausanne. That's yeah, all yeah. good. It's okay. My all French right. is all terrible, good. so thank you. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, so appreciate that. And B Barcelona always gets mentioned, at least because it is a pretty amazing city. Um, so, th so then going into question number two, and it's this is really uh, this comes from a lot of the experience that I've had, and, and been very fortunate also to. to be in contact with many successful people. I'd consider you someone who's very successful as well, Eric. So hopefully you agree with me that, you know, one of the things that sets people who are successful, it really sets them apart from, from others is that when they set their mind to something, they get it like they do it and they get it right the first time, which allows them to probably get to their goals. Oh, I can't believe I did that. I get all nervous. No, I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. Don't worry, Eric. Everybody in the going along family, they're all involved. They're all involved. So it's just a joke. It's just a joke. So, um, of course, 
people who are successful don't get it right the first time. Actually, they get it wrong more than most people, like a whole lot. <laughs> like they get make a lot more mistakes or learning opportunities or however you want to call it. Like the reality is people who are successful, they're doing so many more things and they're trying so many things and they're getting things wrong a lot more frequently. But there's just no joke, Eric. One of the things that I have recognized that those people that are very successful, and yes, I do consider you to be someone who's very successful, is every single time someone who is successful makes a mistake or has a learning opportunity every single time, especially when it's relevant, they stop and they learn from that learning opportunity or mistake. And without a doubt, every single time they put a different strategy, tactic, and or action in place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing help happening. So I'd love for you to share with me and the Going Long family not really what the one mistake was that you made, but what's the one lesson that you learned that you know we need to have to hear today and that someone here in the Going Long family really needs to know that one lesson? What would that one lesson be? I think for me, yeah, like I'm glad you kind of brought it back because I was like, man, Billy, I don't I don't know agree here with <laughs> with <laughs> with getting it right the first time. Cause like you're exactly right. I've made so many learning opportunities, right? So many mistakes. Uh, but I think I think like you said, like the ability to learn and bounce back and know like, Hey man, I messed it up or I did wrong or I lost some money or like the ability to take that and say, you know what? That sucks. I can learn from this and do better the next time. That's super, super key. So I'm so glad you asked this question. I would say the number one thing is being okay with partnerships, knowing that you don't have to do it on your own, like allowing the release of like, the stuff. So I will say maybe one thing that's a little bit like engineering about me was like, I thought like I had to do it on my own. Like Mm -hmm. I thought I was like, okay, with this investing thing, like I can't trust anyone else to do the right thing. And that's so, so, so lame and so wrong. And the second Mm -hmm. I partnered with someone, I was like, wow, you can actually have way, way more success with someone else because you can like partner up with people with sort of different skill sets So I would say like the number one thing I would tell your listeners is trust us. First of all, you can invest out of state and it's going to take partnering with someone. It's going to take using a manager, an agent, even another partner to make that happen. Maybe you don't have the cash to do it, right? So partner up with someone else. End of the day, you have to trust other people. And a lot of times those people are going to do it way better than you. And that's the case Mm -hmm. with me. Like my partners do some stuff way better than me. And I'm so grateful that I was finally able to push through that barrier. So that's probably the one thing I'd say is like actually hear what I'm saying. Partnering is great. Yeah. Partnering is great. And as you said, um, there's a lot that has to go with being able to trust in your, in your partners and your teams and also verifying the things that you want to be able to do are aligned and that they're happening. So, uh, you know, partnerships can absolutely uh, expand uh, growth. So I appreciate you sharing that with us as well, Eric. And that brings us to the third of the going long final three, which is really helping us to fill our minds with more knowledge. So help us understand what is the one book that you would recommend to the going long family today? I think uh, we've, we've named a couple today. Um, I think one really solid book is how to raise capital by Hunter Thompson Mm. or or raising capital for real estate. Sorry. It's just a solid book about real estate syndication, right? He, you know, the book's kind of technically about how to raise capital to do these things, but I think he talks about the business and he's just a good writer in general. So I love that book. Yep. Capital, Raising Capital for Real Estate, Hunter Thompson. So that's a, another uh, vote of confidence for Mr. Thompson. So definitely we'll include that as well in the in the show notes. And um, wow, you know, I, I it's just kind of amazing. I'm thinking that you're, as we're starting to talk, you're going on this trip of lifetime from Durango all the way down to, <laughs> to down to <laughs> Tierra del Fuego, as I like to say. Um, and you're, you know, afterwards, you kind of luck into this real estate thing. Actually, we didn't even really get into too much of what you're talking about with you and your brother and stuff. But you, uh, as you gain that confidence, you gain that insight, you realize like, hey, listen, this is something that I want to continue to do. Not only did you understand the theory behind it as you were already, already building your business, then you realized you took that theory and you started to put it into practice so much that you were putting into practice that you were walking around with your son in the stroller and literally going through the reps, getting the reps, getting more quantity, recognizing what was happening. And then you went from that. And with absolutely no, I would say sales training, formal training, 
we're able to realize and take it to the essence of what a sales professional does, which is really understand how to solve other people's problems and coming up with solutions that can help them do that. And not only did you do it once, you did it multiple times and to the fact that, well, you were able to not only have a, a positive impact in, in Durango, you then also took what you were learning. You started to, as you mentioned, get work with the mentor. We didn't even talk about the meetup that you had in Durango as well. So you're impacting other people's lives positively. And you know what? You've even decided, hey, listen, when the what, what I see in front of me becomes either uh, too small, too expensive, there's a way that I can actually go beyond my backyard, go beyond the thinking that I had and open and have a new mindset, which is to say, where can I actually find and create more value? And doing that in a way that's long distance is absolutely fantastic. And you know what? Yes, I will say it again. Yes, and, and this is coming all from a civil engineer. So you know what? You've got the hard skills and the soft skills. And I'm sure that so many people in the Go Along family are thinking to themselves, Eric, like I got to find out more about Eric and what he's doing at Wild Oak Capital because there's so many things I want to talk to him about. So I would love for you to share share with us. What is the best way for the Going Along family to contact you and find out more about what you're doing and also more about uh, more about your podcast? Let us know the best way to contact you. Yeah, everything's basically on the website, right? Wildoakcapital.com. You can email me directly. I will always answer. I, I love, love talking real estate. It's Eric, E-R-I-C at wildoakcapital.com. And then the uh, podcast is found anywhere you listen to podcasts, The Real Estate Mindset. Um, and it's just been you know, an incredible honor for me to be on the show, Bill. I'm, I'm like so excited to chat with you and, and learn more, you know, and, and get to know you more. All right. Fantastic. Well, absolutely love it. And going along family, you've heard, just uh, check out the website, wildoakcapital.com. Go to Eric at Wild Oak Capital if you want to write him uh, directly, continue the conversation. And also, I know a lot of you connecting with people on LinkedIn and stuff, but when you do that with Eric, please remind him that you heard him or watched him here uh, on the Going Long podcast with Billy Keels and definitely check him out over at the uh, at the Real Estate Mindset. So uh, Eric, thank you very much for investing your time with me and the entire Going Long family, man. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Awesome. So give me just like 10, 15 seconds just to say the last words to the Go Along family. Um, listen, family, it was awesome. Once again, Eric gave you like real life insights. He was even sharing what he was doing with his kid and actually put getting the reps. It was awesome. Make sure you reach out to him. Uh, make sure you take what you've heard today, put it into practice, put it into action, because that's the way that you're going to get to your goals much faster, much sooner. And uh, listen, I'm really, really looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.